please welcome Carol Barnum. So we're going to start with what is content strategy. This is a definition that comes right out of Wikipedia, um, pops up when you Google it. And uh, I left the blue underlined links as they were in the Wikipedia definition because I think they do emphasize the key points that we want to know about content strategy. So it's the planning, development, and management of informational content, written or in other media. The term is particularly common in web development, so you see content strategy uh, as you do with so many UX things, focusing on the web. Um, and it says since the late 1990s, but I'm actually going to make the case for how much more recently it has caught on um, in our field. Um, it's recognized as a field in user experience, so that's really what I'm focusing on today, and also draws interest from adjacent communities such as content management. So actually, if you go back to the 1990s, content strategy was sort of a part of content management, but that's not what I'm focusing on today. Business analysis and technical communication. So that was Wikipedia. Now here, I don't want to belabor these titles, but I just want to show you what an explosion of books there has been very recently focusing on content strategy. So it's, it's a new, new area that is suddenly getting a tremendous amount of attention. So the, the uh, Web Content Strategist Bible in uh, 2009, Content Strategy for the Web in 2009, but I want to say a word about Christina Halverson. How many of you are familiar with Christina Halverson and Content Strategy? A couple of you, okay. She had the first book kind of really focusing on and bringing attention to content strategy for the UX field. And uh, the first edition of that was in 2009, and already there's a second edition out in 2012. Um, Clout quickly followed. That's by Colleen Jones. Colleen Jones uh, does have a content strategy firm in Atlanta. I know Colleen personally. I've heard Christina speak. She, uh, Christina hosts a conference uh, on content strategy in Minneapolis, her home base, and um, it's called CONFAB. How many of you have been or heard about CONFAB? Okay, good, great. So some of you are getting onto the content strategy bandwagon, which is terrific. And then you see a lot of these new titles. Let me try this pointer again and see if I get anywhere with this. I'm not, so I'll give up on it. Um, what do you see here? 2012, 2012, 2012, 2012, 2012. This year, well, in the last six months, this year, a lot of times these 2012 uh, titles are anywhere within 2012, sometimes as, as uh, recent as late 2011. All of a sudden, in 2012, in the last year, we see this tremendous explosion of content strategy in the books. Now, of course, there are hundreds of articles and lots of blogs and things like that to talk about, but I think it's interesting to know that in the short time since about 2009, when Christina Halverson's book came out, we've seen this tremendous upsurge in books and content strategy. And that kind of legitimizes what is happening in content strategy. All right, so who are these authors? Any idea the background of these authors primarily, or um, in many cases, the majority of them? What, what field do they come out of? Anybody? Technical communication. Now, I'm particularly proud of that because I come out of a field in technical communication, and I know that there are a number of you here who are going to stay on for the Writers UA conference. So I think it's interesting that the people who have always owned the content, technical communicators, and cared about user experience, and yet were on the periphery of trying to take complicated interfaces and so forth and make them clear and understandable to the end users have stepped up front and center to talk about why content strategy is so important. So I, I think we, we owe a lot of credit to the technical communicators. So what do content strategists do? The red words kind of highlight the key issues. So it's not just that they write, because that is actually at the bottom of the list, creating content. Content strategists may not even create any content. 
They may be responsible for the creation of content if they're in a supervisory or managerial role, but they may never actually write content, or they may, depending upon the size of the group that they work in. But what do they do? They start with, a, with an audit, so they audit, create a content inventory so that they know what all the content is and can do an analysis of do we need it, why do we have it, when was it last updated, what are the pieces. They plan for the creation, publication, and governance of useful, usable content. Now, I put that in green because those are really the tenets of user experience, useful, usable content. And they manage the content creation and revision. So content strategy is a managerial position that provides a great career opportunity for those of you who are interested in content, come out of a technical communication background, and so forth. So the first real article that got a lot of attention about this was written by Rachel Lovinger, Content Strategy, the Philosophy of Data in 2007, so that's six years ago, in Boxes and Arrows. And she was at the time, I don't know Rachel personally, but she was at the time, had the title of a content strategist, which was a title almost nobody had back in 2007, and she worked for Razorfish. So she said content strategy is to copywriting as information architecture is to design. So that's a kind of an interesting thing to think about. Content strategy is to copywriting as information architecture is to design. So it's a structural element in relationship to the design of the interface. So how do you know if your content is useful and usable? What do you think you need to do to find that out? Pardon me? Test, test it, exactly. So we're now going to start focusing on how to test the content. Um, so overheard in testing. Right? Or I don't know if you can read that. We're testing the site, but we don't have the content yet, the help or the user assistance yet. Now, of course, there are ways to test whether you need, where you need help and user assistance by not providing it and finding out where your participants in a usability study say, oh, I'd want to click on help here. But oftentimes, if a product is fairly well developed along, it's really unfortunate not to know about the content piece because it's typically not included, even in draft form, at the level of doing a lot of usability testing. So oftentimes the content is like set aside, not thought about, not part of what people seem to care about. And yet, we're discovering how important content is. So how many of you have ever done usability testing with this? Yeah, when I see lorem ipsum, I just want to scream because it tells me at the front end how irrelevant the designers or developers find the content piece in the user experience. So top findings in testing. So when you do usability testing, what are the typical sorts of things, categories of things that you find when you conduct testing? What's a typical thing you almost always find when you do usability testing? Somebody. Navigation, absolutely. So issues with navigation, what else? That's great, things like that. What else do you typically find are issues, a category of issues in usability testing? Terminology. terminology, absolutely, that's right. What else? So we've got navigation, we've got terminology. What else might you typically find in usability testing? Not having enough space works yet. Okay, no, no interaction, that would be, yes, I would hope so would work, but maybe very, very early testing where we're just kind of getting an idea about the look and feel. But yeah, not having, pardon me, not having sufficient navigation to be able, or interaction to be able to understand the user experience because there's not enough built out. Good. What else do you sometimes typically find in usability testing? Where is it? Okay, where is it? So maybe not, not being able to find what you want because perhaps it's an information architecture issue or the, the labels don't make sense or you can't drill down far enough. So that whole scent of navigation, how do I get where I want to go? Somebody said something over here? 
mental model, absolutely, this doesn't fit the way I want to work or the way I'm used to from prior work. So mental model is a really big category. So I think you've actually covered the kinds of things I wanted to share with you. So here they are. I think findability was, was the one we just heard. I can't find what I'm looking for. Navigation, terminology, mental model, and then the whole design of the page. Where do I look? What am I looking at? Am I seeing what I need to be seeing? And so on. So these are typically, but not entirely, the sorts of things that you'll find when you're conducting usability testing. And they're sort of related to content, a number of them. So what about the content? When we start to focus on the content, that is not just on the typical sorts of things we find in usability testing, what are the kinds of questions that we want to ask that tell us we're really focusing on the content? First of all, can the users find and view the content? Obviously, that's critical. Can you find, if you've got a task and you need to find some information, can you get to that information? But that is often where it stops, when the focus is not on the content itself. Right? They say, oh yeah, they found the content. Great. All right, we're done. Well, in a content strategy, that is only the beginning. So the next question is, do the users understand the content they find and want to take action? That is, are they motivated to take action? As opposed to, yes, I found the content, yes, I've read the content, but I don't want to do anything as a result of having read the content. And can they complete the action? So those two items go together. So now, this is from Colleen Jones' book, Clout. Now, we're starting to think about what is the content strategy that we want to focus on. Not just can they find the content, but that can they use the content? Do they want to engage with the content? Do they want to act as a result of engaging with the content? And that's what happens when you focus on usability testing with the content. So, questions that my good friend Ginny Reddish focused on in her book, Letting Go of the Words, second edition, 2012, is, is it what users want and need? Again, thinking about content strategy, and she's focusing on the web in Letting Go of the Words. Is it presented with good information design? Again, we're thinking about does, does it appeal? Does it allow the user to quickly find um, get a good feeling, an element of trust, and those kinds of things with the information as it is presented. Is it organized, again, that mental model in a way that, user, that works for users? Does the writing help users skim and quickly grab the information that they need? Are the words the ones the users understand? Is it in the user's language? And do the users interpret the images accurately? So those are some of the questions that she's, she raises that, that are about the content. So why does content matter? Because it is, you can make the business case. So when you've got a good content strategy and you've got a good user experience focusing on the content, it can increase your sales. If you've got a sales-oriented interface, it can increase customer satisfaction. That could go for an intranet, so it could be internal as well as external, information seeking and so on. And it can, if you've got customer support, as a cost center, it can reduce the number of calls, which can be a huge savings. So these are ways to make the case for good content. So what I want to do now is I want to focus on two case studies from my usability testing at the Usability Center at Southern Polytechnic. And both of these studies focus on the content. So the first one is Intercontinental Hotels Group which uh, includes uh, Intercontinental Hotels, Holiday Inn, Crown Plaza, and uh, lots of other, uh, uh, other hotel groups. So it's Intercontinental Hotels Group, and they have rolled out a, uh, a software application for hotel managers, large and small, around the world to understand what their current footprint is with regard to green or sustainability initiatives and how to measure, how to gain improvements and measure those improvements. So how to manage their current um, consumption of utilities, water waste, those kinds of things. How to create a plan to improve on those, the consumption of those um, 
diminishing resources, and then how to measure your success. So um, it's a big deal with hotels. It's a huge expense, and um, it, it, uh, it was a very high priority for Intercontinental Hotels Group. So we engaged with them over a series of studies. Um, so that's a little bit about the Green Engage product. So the first round of testing with them began in uh, February 2010. And um, small number of users, I'm going to talk more about that when we have the Q&A with Joe after this session. Um, but how many of you conduct usability studies with small number of participants? Okay, about half, about two-thirds, yeah. So we know that small numbers of users can be very powerful and very effective if you have certain conditions in place. So 14 users back in February of 2010, the goals of this study were to understand things like navigation and workflow, uh, defects and system feedback issues, and perceptions, which I've highlighted the word perceptions because that's what they said they were interested in, the perceptions regarding the content. That is, look at it and go, mm, yeah, that looks useful, that looks interesting, yeah, I think I might want to do something that with that, but just at the perception level, not at the actual use level, for things like the content itself, terminology, the labels, and the visuals themselves. And then to identify training requirements. Now, this is interesting because I was actually contracted to a company who was contracted to Intercontinental Hotels Group, and the company's focus was what with regard to usability testing? Any ideas? The company that hired me. Training. Okay, so they wanted to develop, they were, they were going to be hired to develop the training for, for this software product, and so they were very interested in what were the training requirements. Of course, you might say to yourself, well, the product shouldn't require any training, right? But we won't go there. All right, so the round one results were that users liked the concept. Oh, this is a great idea. We really need this at our hotel. But they hated the execution. And they said things like, I believe this will be useful. I love this quote. Once everyone understands it. That is, once we slog through trying to figure it out, it's probably going to be a good thing. And interestingly, we provided the opportunity for the participants. These were general managers of hotels, and sometimes, depending upon the size of the hotel, they're engineers. So we provided the op option for them to say, if you get to the place where you're really stuck and you can't figure out what you would want to do, give us a call, because we'd like to know that's where you'll be calling headquarters or that's where you'll be asking somebody to help you. So it was interesting to see in this very small study that 11 calls were made to assistance from four different users. That's a high cost. To Intercontinental Hotels Group in having to field that number of calls, even if it's not from every participant, just the fact that out of that small number of participants, four users repeatedly called. That is, they were stuck, they were stuck, they were stuck through task after task. So the second round, uh, it took place in October, so it was about nine months later. And what was interesting about this, as a result of the first round, which had had about a, a year of development, is that the interface was deemed to be so bad at that point that it could not be fixed. So they threw the whole thing out, including the original development team, brought in another development team, and then asked us to test the prototype with 12 users in October. However, the shocking part of that was that there was absolutely no change in the content. So they just poured in the old content to the completely new redesign of the interface, putting all that effort on interface design, no effort in content strategy. Same goals as round one. This time they wanted to obtain feedback on users' perceptions regarding content terminology, labeling, and visuals. So exact same goals as before. Focus on perceptions. So what you're seeing here, I hope, is an evolution that people oftentimes in usability testing and in development don't have the content strategy piece 
integral to the development process. It comes later. So hopefully you all are going to have something to do to affect that in the future. So now the new goal was that they wanted to measure SUS score improvement. Now SUS is the um, acronym for System Usability Scale created by John Brook for Digital Corporation in 1986. How many of you are familiar with SUS? Okay, about a third of you. All right, so it's a 10 point 10 statements on a Likert scale, and there is a composite score that has had a lot of meta-analysis done on it, and we know that a median score of 68 from all this analysis of these different studies and different platforms and so on gives you at least something upon which to measure whatever score you get if you use the SUS questionnaire to determine where your product is in relationship to the analysis of these many studies. The best use of SUS, however, is in measuring your own improvements as you go through iterative development cycle. So if you're, if you're going to be using SUS, and it's built into Moray, by the way, which makes it extremely handy. So how many of you use Moray in your usability testing? So you know about the SUS at the end of that. You can just call up the SUS. It calculates the scores for you. It can uh, graph that for you, so it's a, a very easy way to use it, and that also demonstrates the popularity of it is that it's, it's built into Moray. So um, the best measure of SUS, though, is in your own product development. So if you're using an iterative product development uh, cycle, which, uh, you know, is the preferred method, then you can see, hopefully, improvements in your SUS score as you continue to build user experience into your product. And I use the word product very loosely interface very loosely for whatever it is in which a person is relating to a thing, an experience. So that's a terrible uh, version of it, but it is in your slides. It does show, that's as big as I could get it. It does show the SUS 10 question questionnaire. All right, so the SUS scores were these. In round one, which was the first study, the result was 54. So they are well below that median of 68. In round two, it went up to 73. So they had made significant improvement through the, the design, the redesign of the interface for the product, and, and it was demonstrated in improvements in the SUS. All right, so round three took place in March 2011. This was a very small study. It was only four participants. We were basically in beta at this point, and they were gathering data from a number of different beta testers and so on, but they wanted a very small usability study to add on to that. So we were pre-launch. It was a two-day study, which was interesting. On the first day, the general managers of these hotels set up their hotel by putting in all the information about their utilities and consumption and so forth based on their actual bills. Um, and these were all users of the first horrible version of the product. Okay, so they had slogged through and figured out how to use the first version and now they were giving feedback through their experience of working with the pre-launch version of V2, the second version. So on the second day of the study, they read reports generated about their own hotel, and they created action plans. And the results were that the users loved the changes. Oh, this is so much better than what I've been dealing with. That other product was terrible. So in comparison, this is great. They thought that the concepts and the functions were more fully integrated, that everything was there together, that it was easy enough to, to navigate around and find what they needed. They thought that the home page was helpful. In the first study, they couldn't even tell they were on their own home page. It sort of looked like an advertisement for a hotel. It didn't look like their homepage. So they didn't even know, oh, this is my homepage? They, it was that difficult. So they thought the homepage was now helpful. It showed some current data about their hotel. And that they thought that the application would support the user's goals of making their hotels more sustainable, more green. Their SUS score now, remember round 152, round 2, 73, round 3, 94, exclamation points running off the page. Now the interaction design firm based in London that actually was uh, ch in charge of handling this redesign were so excited about these scores that they have broadcast them widely at conferences that they've attended um, in Europe and also in their own marketing. However, it was four people who were current users of the old dreadful version. 
So you have to kind of take that with a grain of salt. I've never seen a score before or since that high in using sus. Has anybody, anybody in here seen a score in the 90s? It's just done happen. So our recommendations on the basis of this study were that they needed a test with new users because their whole goal was to sell this product to, ho to their hotels, franchise as well as captive, charge a monthly fee all around the world. So it was meant to be a money maker for Intercontinental Hotels Group and they, didn't, they knew nothing about the new user experience. They should refine the current content, they had never changed it, and they should test with new content, things that users said that they wanted that wasn't in the current version, and that they should incorporate context-sensitive help. So there were a lot of terminology things, things that didn't make sense, and there was no context-sensitive help in the interface. They had to go over, they had to leave and go over somewhere to a help system that didn't help them. All right, so round four, April of 2012, 16 users. Here's the exciting thing. Totally new group now approaches me about doing this, and they are subject matter experts. So for the first time, the team responsible for the continuing development of Green Engage was comprised of people who understood sustainability, green initiatives, the content. They knew the content. So that was exciting. It wasn't just interaction de designers who had skills in that area, but also managed by people who knew the content. So now the focus could be on the content. Finally, we had people who cared about the content, who knew about the content, and wanted to test the content. So the goal now, and they included new users in their pool, was to learn how well users understand, oh wow, we're really drilling down now into what is the content, what does it mean, can I use it? So they, they were now focusing on, as a goal on whether users could understand the content and could act on the content. And in that case, it meant being able to set up an action plan. They were particularly interested in these solutions. They called it green solutions. That is, can you find a solution to an to a initiative that you would like to, to adopt for your hotel, and can you set up an action plan to address that? So the participants were directed to find ways to make your hotel more sustainable, so it was very focused on their own particular hotel, large or small, around the world, so we did in-lab testing and remote testing around the world, uh, use the content to select a solution to match your goal, show us how you would implement a solution, not just, oh yeah, I see, okay, yeah, this is where I would implement a solution, but actually set up something where you would implement a solution and then add this to your action plan. So that, those were the tasks. Now, uh, this is the Green Engage um, screen. And again, I guess you'll have to look at your own notes to see it any better. Let me see if my pointer works better this close. Okay, so along the top we have action groups, um, green housekeeping products and practices, uh, we've got a summary here, we've got a narrative here, we've got, um, I can't even read that far away what all those links are, we've got stuff down here, and users said, what am I supposed to click on? So here comes the place that they're actually supposed to start working with it, and it's just too much information, no sense of where to begin, and that was a, an oft-heard refrain, where do I begin? All right, so users said, I imagine I'd have to read all these things. It looks nice, good ideas, but I want action that I can profit for our hotel. And oftentimes these general managers were speaking for their owner, who was their boss. So I need to be able to demonstrate to my boss that whatever cost I Want, recommend we spend will affect our bottom line. I'm looking for a solution, users said, rather than an idea. So that whole idea of the content strategy, what do users want, was not being effectively addressed in the um, study that focused on the content for the first time. So the top negative findings were, as you might imagine, findability. So users couldn't find simple, low-cost solutions. They saw lots of high-end, expensive things they could do, but they couldn't find something very, very simple like 
green cleaning products, for example, that came up. I'm looking for green cleaning products that will not adversely affect the environment. Is there a place I can buy these? Is there a product that you recommend? Things like that. They had issues with organization and terminology. Again, you always find these in usability testing. They couldn't understand the difference between green solutions and the action plan. Uh, what's the difference between an action plan and an action list? And to be honest with you, I didn't know the difference either. As much as I'd been working with them on this product, it's just those aren't the sorts of things that just stay with you. What are levels? So actually, you could attain LEED certification with using this plan, but, but people in other parts of the world didn't know about LEED and they didn't understand levels. What's a level one, a level two, a level three, those kinds of things. And the content, oh, there's lots of content, but the wrong content. And it's in the wrong order. The stuff I want is way below the fold. And here you're giving me this whole narrative at the top of the screen. SUS score 50. So they took a giant step backwards in their SUS score because now the focus was on the content. However, the good news is, is that the manager of this group was a, a uh, subject matter expert. There were content creators on board. They were going to be able to not just say, oh, those are nice findings and stick them in a drawer somewhere and never think about them again, but they were going to be able to take what they saw in the usability study and they were going to be able to actually start working on the content. All right, so that's study number one. And then very quickly, study number two, uh, more recent, is with footsmart.com. Now, footsmart.com is a um, web retail presence only, no brick and mortar. Thank you, I see five minutes, great. And um, they uh, sell products related to people who have um, either uh, foot problems or injuries as a result of um, issues relating to their feet. So the facts in this case were that uh, FootSmart hired Content Science, that company that Colleen Jones manages, and Colleen's company hired us at the Usability Center. All right, so the study goals were, what, the, what, what uh, Content Science had done was that they took the original content from the FootSmart website for, and they revised it based on their content audit and their content strategy for FootSmart. So what we did was we did an A-B study of the existing content for a particular article on something I didn't know the terminology of before I started the study, but plantar fasciitis. And they then also took their redesigned uh, content and they did a comparison where half the participants started with A and half the participants started with B, B being the prototype. And what was nice about it, it was all done on the computer, and so the participants did not know, they looked exactly the same, which was the original site and which was the prototype site. And they had a shopping task as a result of reading the content, which drove them, no matter whether they were in the prototype site or the original site, it drove them to the same place for the shopping cart. So it was transparent to the participants. They didn't know what was the prototype. So they wanted to verify uh, that the, the prototype B was a, an improved direction and that users would be able to respond more positively, they hoped, to the voice and tone of the prototype to the quality and credibility of the prototype, to the content and completeness of the prototype. And that when they, the critical thing for FootSmart is that when they compared the two layouts, that it would be easier to make a shopping decision and get into the shopping cart process through the design of the page for the prototype versus the original. All right, so we had two groups of participants. This was a one-day study, very small. And as a matter of fact, on Friday, I'm making, um, the video highlights tape, uh, oral presentation to FootSmart um, as a result of this study. Four women and two men. So we decided in one day that their largest audience was women. And because they were on two very, very different demographic groups, um, we wanted to get just a little bit of feedback from the smaller groups. So the women were, as you can see, over 50, had experienced foot pain, had very wide feet, hard to fit, like to wear comfort shoes, and the interesting characteristic in terms of recruiting them was that they were generally very much overweight, which contributed to their foot problems. The men were very different. Younger, fit, 
uh, heavily into uh, some group sport like running or playing basketball or something like that and then would potentially sustain an injury as a result of their athletic um, activity. All right, so the scenarios were to, to uh, read the first article, whether it was A or B, on plantar fasciitis. First have reactions to the way the page, where are you, what does it look like, what can you do here? General reactions to the, to the design of the page. Then read the article, answer some comprehension questions about it, answer some questions about uh, your impression of the credibility of the content, um, and then shop for a heel cushion and then do the same task on the other side. So this is the original screen. All the way through this, you will see that it has this shop now. There's one at the top you can't see that says shop now. And it scrolls way, way down. So it's a great big long page that scrolls way down. And this is the prototype site, which actually had several pages. So you get to the bottom of the page and you click next. And also, you will notice that it has um, illustrations here this area at the top where you see the picture of the foot and those kinds of things. All right, so very quickly, the results were amazing. So in this one day study, six out of six people liked the prototype version B better than A. Now that's a real affirmation of content strategy. Six out of six people found the heel cushion more easily and sometimes couldn't find it at all on the original site. They found it more easily on B. Six out of six did not find it on A very easily. Five out of six, what are you gonna do next after reading the content? Five out of six said they would take this information and consult their doctor probably before making a purchase, but that it was valuable to know that the content gave them the information that made them feel confident about being able to have that conversation with the doctor and then come back to the website to make the purchase later. Three out of six liked the lack of sell. You saw that shop now, shop now, shop now on A, the original site. They liked it better that it wasn't pushing sales all the way through B. Three of six complained about redundant content in A. Three of six had additional questions in the original site, and two of six wanted the option to access more content on B. So one of the lessons from that was have links for them to be able to go deeper if they want to learn more. All right, so the winner is content strategy because clear as day that the content strategy approach to writing that content was, was a huge improvement over the original. All right, so today's takeaway is this, content strategy plus usability testing equals good business. And I'm done. Thank you.